SJC 11874, Commonwealth v. David Magadini. you some water. I beg your pardon? We're going to get some water. Once oh, yes. <laughs> no, no, you're all set. Thank okay. You. You, may, you, you may commence. Thank you. Thank you kindly, Mr. Chief Justice. May it please the court. My name is Joseph Schneiderman. I rise for the appellant, David Magadini. Of four issues in this case, <laughs> the principal issue is whether or not Mr. Magadini, as a homeless person, was entitled to have the jury consider and have guidance on the law whether he trespassed to take shelter out of necessity on winter's nights. For three did, reasons. Did, did he only do it on exceptionally cold nights, do we know? Yes, Your Honor. There's not, there's not definite testimony in the record as to the weather, but on March 4th there was testimony that it was approximately zero, and every officer who arrested him agreed, or I'm sorry, who cited him agreed these were desperately cold nights. June so, 10th? April 8th? That was? June 10th? Certainly not June 10th, certainly not April 8th, and to be clear, Your Honors, the necessity defense applies to the five winter charges, which are February 20th, 21st, March 4th, March 6th, and March 28th. So certainly there is no issue about the April 8th and the June 10th charge. Now, if it's necessity, it really sort of means he's got no viable alternative, right? Absolutely. And could you clarify what the record is as to whether or not he had money available to him? Because it seems to me that this is not just about what the availability of shelters was, but was there any reason to think he could not, he didn't have enough money to go to a motel? Justice Lank, he did have money. There is, uh, he did testify that he had money. Um, there is not further testimony that elucidates uh, how he could use that money to go to a hotel or to go to a hotel or a motel But yes, he did have money and he also testified that but no testimony as to how much No testimony as to a, an amount he did testify he had money for an apartment But for seven years his apartment search had been futile He had looked in Great Barrington and indeed one of the Commonwealth's own witnesses Alan Kalish specifically testified even though I saw this man with money, I refused an apartment to him. Can you get a, a hotel room or a motel room without a credit card? I'm not sure, Your Honor. I believe you may need a credit card to reserve. You could pay in cash. We don't know if Mr. Magadini has uh, a credit card. Uh, or cash. What, what, tr what troubles me a little bit here is this. Winter nights are cold. He's chosen to live on the street because he wants to stay in Great Barrington. So regardless of how much money he might have and his ability to get a place to live in an adjacent town, since I want to be in Great Barrington, I then, and I know it will be cold, somehow I can sleep on private properties because there will be a necessity. It just doesn't resonate like the kind of necessities we are thinking about. Or our case law has been involved. An emergency, something happens. Justice Cordy, I absolutely agree that this is a bit very different from how this court has previously dealt with the necessity defense. But by the same token, sister courts have recognized that we don't expect the homeless to shed their homelessness or indeed to, that their homelessness doesn't matter in the necessity. Well, if I can't afford to live in a town, do I have a right to stay there and live as a homeless person anyway and take shelter in private properties whenever I, when it gets cold? Certainly not, Your Honor. I, the town is not, the town is definitely not the insurer of the homeless. If I, I understand and follow Your Honor's question. A town is definitely not the insurer of the homeless. In, it, but it, but, it, but in, I think that in, in terms of Alternatives, if he testifies as he did, I only can, I, I'm going to stay in Great Barrington. That's where I'm, you know, you can tell me that there's somewhere in Pittsfield, but even if it was two minutes away, I'm not going. 
Um, if he says, I only can stay in Great Barrington, does that go to whether it's reasonable that there are, that there may be reasonable alternatives that he isn't pursuing? I mean, I, I guess this, this is the question. Certainly. Uh, if you, if, if he says I'm staying in Great Barrington and you say he should have in any event had an instruction on necessity. Absolutely. Assuming that to be the case, certainly the Commonwealth could argue, right, to the jury, he doesn't have a right to stay. I mean, we don't have, just what you're saying, we're not the insurer, we don't have to find him a, a place here. Uh, so there is no necessity. You could argue that. You're just saying it gets to the jury. Absolutely, Your Honor. It is the jury's province, ultimately, to make that decision as to whether or not Mr. Magadini uh, could stay in Great Barrington reasonably or should have to travel elsewhere. And to the more specific point of traveling elsewhere, under the circumstances he faced, of a winter's night in Great Barrington, I would submit that it is unrealistic to expect him in that moment, and this is also a key underpinning of the necessity defense, and it goes back to Justice Cordy's question, the necessity defense is a snapshot of what the defendant knew at the time and what the defendant was facing at the time. In the snapshot of a night, and there was testimony that he was found in Barrington House and at Castle Street at night, he should not be expected to leave Great Barrington then because his, possibility, his ability to leave Great Barrington then is severely impeded. As the ACLU of Massachusetts has rightfully pointed out in their amicus brief, Berkshire County, and as I'm sure the court is well aware, is rural. There is very limited uh, public transit. But if you have intentionally created the emergency by deciding to stay in a town where you cannot afford to live and you know it's going to be cold, not just on February 20th, but probably on a whole bunch of nights in February. Isn't that different? That doesn't give the sense. You say, well, just take a picture. It was cold that night, so just don't look at anything else when you think of were there reasonable alternatives. You just look at that night. That doesn't make sense in this case, I don't think. Justice Cordy, I absolutely agree that we do not you cannot enhance or aggravate risks. And that is also absolutely a common thread of this court's and of Massachusetts jurisprudence on necessity. We do not excuse defendants who aggravate risks. I believe, though, it reads too much into the record to say that he is aggravating risks because he is choosing to stay in Great Barrington. I absolutely agree, though, with Your Honor's point. Great Barrington is cold. Berkshire County is cold. This is winter, I have to act. But Mr. <clears throat> Magadini, by his own testimony, also specifically said, I use blankets, I use scarves, I use gloves. In the end, it should be up to the jury to make the ultimate decision of whether or not blankets, scarves, and gloves protected him, or if, as Your Honor is suggesting, he did engage in some sort of intentional aggravation that would take him out of the ambit of the so necessity. it's not a question of um, law, that if you could have moved to Florida with the last $100 on the plane ticket and whatever, you should have. It's whether or not in the circumstances in which he found himself. You're, you're suggesting it's an appropriate question for the jury even to ask, how did you get yourself in that situation? Or are, that, that's where I'm not sure. I, I get that that might be mm -hmm. one, one thing you're saying. Or are you saying, well, no, it's not really. You, you take him as you find him in those circumstances right then. It was cold. He was there. Maybe next week, you know, given the several no trespasses notice, he should think about moving. I don't know. But that was cold. He was freezing. He could have died. There are no bus services. You know, I, we don't know anything about the money. You could talk about it to the jury. Right, which one? Justice Duffley, I believe it is your second formulation, which is that um, as I follow uh, your honor, uh, it should be up to the jury to make that decision of the particular circumstances he knew. And I believe that's further buttressed by this court's jurisprudence that the necessity defense entails, as the court has put it, the efficacy of lawful alternatives in proportion to the gravity of the danger. So as your honor is driving at, 
it would definitely be up to the jury to make that determination. It's up to the judge to make the determination, has he presented some evidence? And we submit he did present May some. May I ask you? I'm sorry, uh, Justice Hines. The case you rely on from California, yes. People versus Icorn, that involved, is, isn't that in your brief? You, yes, it is, oh, okay. Your Honor. Okay. Absolutely. Didn't that involve a public place? And my question to you is, how do we reconcile the necessity defense with the rights of private property owners? Justice Hines, I'm very glad you asked me that. Because, really? Yes, <laughs> very. <laughs> I'm very glad you asked me that because I would suggest that under these circumstances, certainly, I agree with your honor. Private property owners are also not expected to be the insurers of the homeless. And private property owners may certainly ban people as they see fit. I think the sound analogy, though, to the Icorn case from the California Court of Appeal is that at least Barrington House is fairly akin to a civic center because Barrington House, and this is uncontroverted testimony in the record, contains storefronts, contains public hallways, and is there's no impediment to coming in and out of Barrington House, and that has also been an important... Um, but it's still private property. Absolutely. It's not a government building. Absolutely, Your Honor. That is a difference in kind between this case and between ICORN in that it was the city of Santa Ana's um, civic center. But I would submit that the analogy still holds in as much as, although this is not a great Barrington civic center, this is still a place where people congregate, and this court has recognized that if there's an open door... Which is this? Barrington House? Barrington House, yes, Your that, Honor. Is that 4 Castle or 284 May... Um, well, which street? Oh, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Several different street addresses we're talking about here. I apologize, Your Honor. Uh, 4 Castle Street is an apartment building. 284 Main Street is Barrington House. I apologize if that was not clear. So some of the offenses took place at the apartment building, some at this sort of commercial mixed-use building. That's absolutely correct. And to go back to Justice Hines' question, I think what's also important about uh, Barrington House, Mr. Magdini said, I go to a little nook off to the side where there is a heater in Barrington House. And there, that was uncontroverted. And at Castle Street, he only went as far as the vestibule. So which also goes back to Justice Duffley's question, which is the relative proportion of the intrusion or the criminal conduct relative to the harm. Um, in, in some cases, there's a correlation between mental illness and homelessness. Is, is that true in this case? Is that an issue in this case? I don't believe that that is an issue in this case, Your Honor. I know Attorney Hall wanted at sentencing an aid in sentencing evaluation, but I think that correlation is not necessarily... There was no evidence of it? There's, we don't know, not a, on this record. I mean, you didn't see any evidence at the trial. We didn't see any evidence at the trial, that's correct. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Mr. Bossy, not yet, not yet, not yet. We have Ms. Rossman. Appreciate your eagerness, but they split their time. Good morning, Ms. Rossman. Good morning, Mr. Chief Justice, <clears throat> and may it please the court. Uh, Amiki has two points to make here today. The first actually addresses Justice Hines' question and Justice Botsford's earlier question that the necessity defense already reconciles how to balance the necessity defense and private property owners' rights, and that's in the jury not giving a jury instruction here to allow that body to determine the necessity defense is inconsistent with this court's case law, including Kendall, because there was some evidence that at the time of the crimes, Mr. Magadini had no effective legal alternatives. Second, the Commonwealth's argument that we should look back to what Mr. Magadini may have been able to do weeks or months prior would, is legally irrelevant and it would fundamentally change the way that this court has always but, but, analyzed. But, but, but wait a second. So I, um, it's cold one night. I, I go in and seek shelter. And I know it's a really cold winter. Um, it's going to be cold on future nights, but I don't have any obligation to look for some place to stay. 
Under this court's doctrine, Your Honor, it is not for the judge to determine what happens that far back in the past. The necessity defense has never looked that far. We always look at what is occurring at the time of the crime in question. Kirk, in, in a lot of those cases, it's, there isn't a sequence of events. There's, there's just one incident. I mean, if, I'm, if I happen to be in Great Barrington and, and, and if for some reason I've been robbed and, and I don't have, and my cell phone is gone and I have no way of communicating um, and, 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 uh, and, and I walk into the Barrington house and, and sleep on the floor uh, just for that one night, um, I might have an insanity defense, uh, or uh, a necessity <laughs> defense. I may have an insanity <laughs> defense as well as a necessity defense. Um, but uh, here, that the, there's, it's been going on for a long period of time, for months. Um, does that somehow vitiate the right to an insanity defense, or, or a necessity <laughs> defense? Not under our case, Your Honor. Again, it ends up being a question if there's any place where we're going to consider that. It should be within the body of the juror, which is uh, the repository of the community's conscience. It's a question of fact for the jury to decide, not for the judge. So, but, so how does the jury factor in the, that it's, it's not a public building? It, what is the jury told about that under your analysis? The overarching instruction to the jury, Your Honor, asks the jury to balance the competing harms. And there may be a difference between when someone trespasses on public property in terms of the harm versus the harm that would occur in trespassing in commercial property. And that's also very different from someone who breaks into a residential home. But even the nature of me explaining this highlights these are questions of fact that are proper for the jury to determine. Now, I, I gather that if Great Barrington had a policy that said when a police officer finds somebody on a freezing night, there is a place they can take them to that you would lose. Absolutely, Your Honor, and that highlights why it's so important to ensure that what we focus on is what's available at the time of the crime in question. If there are legally effective alternatives, such as a standing policy to allow someone to have shelter on those cold nights, then that means that the necessity defense isn't available. But that's the way to handle those difficult questions of repetition. What is not the way to do it, and what the Commonwealth is asking this court to do here, is to either fundamentally change the way this court has always applied the necessity defense, or even worse, create a carve out just for homeless individuals where we only ask them these types of questions. But if you had, okay, this is this case taking place in the winter of 2014, I believe, right? That's correct. Your Honor. Okay, and um, does this mean that every winter from 2014 to, I don't know when, it gets cold every winter, um, at least until, well, for a while. Uh, so um, um, does he go to the jury every single year when Pittsfield, uh, I mean, not Pittsfield, when, 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 when the police in Great Barrington arrest him? I mean, is there a trial every year raising the same defense and it's always going to be a jury question? So long as the defendant is able to put forward some evidence that at the time of the crime there was no effective alternative, then that does become a fact question. I think it's a question, Your Honor, of who is going to bear the burden of the crisis of homelessness in Massachusetts. And that's what this case comes down to. Are we going to say that because you live in a community where they've made a decision not to provide shelter, Great Barrington right now is only providing... Or, or they do have shelter, but... I mean, it's it's mixed about the what's the construct. That's correct. But Anna. but let's say uh, he can't go there because he he just has been so obnoxious that anybody any I mean the facility simply won't have him for good reason. What happens then? If at the time of that crime you're under under this court's current doctrine, he has some evidence that there's no effective legal alternative, then it does become a question for the jury. And again, the jury may balance that. It is quite possible in this case that the jury may still have convicted Master, Mr. Magadini on these facts, even if they've been given the jury instruction. But we don't know the answer to that question because the judge usurped their role to consider that question a fact. And that's why this case needs to be sent back for a new trial. I see that my time is up. Let me thank the court for the opportunity to make arguments today. Now, Mr. Bossy. Good morning. May it please the court, John Bossy for the Commonwealth. Uh, the Commonwealth respectfully requests that this court affirm the defendant's convictions. Um, the judge did not commit error in denying 
the request for the uh, necessity defense because a foundation was never laid. And the foundation was never laid because with respect to the third element and the, under the necessity defense, there was legal alternatives. But Mr. But Mr. Bossett, what, what were they? <coughs> could, yeah. could just before you get to that, what they were, that it was a motion in limine before trial, was it? That, that's correct. And, um, and so the, he wasn't allowed to develop any, <coughs> any evidence about no alternatives, right? Because the judge kept cutting him off. Well, there was a motion in limine before trial, and, and the judge, um, from my understanding, that they spoke in chambers, and the judge said, I'll, I'll keep it in mind. And then... Um, so he didn't he, rule you can't do this thing. Right. He, he didn't rule until the close of evidence. Okay. Okay. And, until the defense rested. And then they had a discussion, and then he said, I'm not going to give it, because he went into uh, getting to <coughs> Justice Gant's question which were the uh, legal alternatives. And it's Commonwealth's position that the legal alternatives consisted of, he stated that he had sufficient money to uh, rent an apartment, but uh, although he said it was difficult to get an apartment, he only testified that he looked for an apartment in Great Barrington. When the prosecutor asked him if he looked to surrounding communities, uh, such as Pittsfield, West Sockbridge, North Adams, he, says, you know, he, he said, I was born here, um, I lived here my whole life. I intend to stay here. I, I refuse to leave Great Barrington. The second alternative uh, that the defendant had was um, in 2007, uh, he, uh, he could no longer stay at Construct because of certain issues uh, that he testified to that he had with the shelter. However, he made no effort to go back in 2014 and tell the officials at the shelter that I'm now willing to comply with your rules please let me in, and he, and he made, and, and he didn't testify, and because he never went back in 2014 to ask them uh, to let him back into the shelter, he, he never testified that, the question, th that though, they denied him access. The, the question though, isn't it, what, was his, what were his alternatives at the time? Not what his alternatives were last week, last month, last year. Um, suppose he had been in the shelter in Pittsfield and had gotten a ride to Great Barrington that day, and it turned very cold. Well, I mean, he had the alternative of staying in Pittsfield at the shelter. Why did he come to Great Barrington? But he did. And don't you look at it as of the time that he's freezing cold and he could die? Well, I, I, I would say that, one, um, the individual has, has, has to seek assistance. So. If there's a shelter in town, then he should, rather than trespassing, he should seek as assistance from the shelter first. If, if there's no shelter in town, seek assistance from the police, and then the police can hopefully uh, provide assistance to him. And I would also suggest- They sure didn't do it in this case. Well, right, and, and, and there was not, but I think, and this isn't in the record, but I think the police just have gone into a situation with Mr. Magadini where they feel that as though they cannot be of assistance to him. The, the shelter officials have tried to help him in the past, but he's got to learn to cooperate in, so, so in order these, for them. These, so these hypotheticals that you're suggesting are all well and good, but th they don't apply here. I mean, the, the, the police didn't direct him to any shelter that was available, and, and, uh, and they didn't take him in but the police department that night. He did testify he had sufficient money to rent an apartment. So and, and what, what does the booking record indicate in terms of the amount of money he had on his person? The, the, there's nothing in the record, even though, you know, after the fact, the police officer told me, well, here are all his booking sheets with, with the cash that, that we found on him during, you know. He didn't have any, he really didn't have any money. Maybe pocket change? No, oh, and again, there's nothing on the record, but <clears throat> but um, the booking sheets that the officer showed me, he had he had hundred, hundred, you know, a couple hundred dollars at some times, one hundred and fifty dollars, eighty dollars. He, he has some money. Well, he so, testified he had he had available funds. Right, and an so if he has sufficient money to rent an apartment, we would <clears throat> suggest that if the police cannot provide assistance to him, then he knows about the shelter in Pittsfield. He could have taken a cab uh, to Pittsfield. So his, 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 he really should have gone back to construct and say, hey, I'm, I'm willing to comply with your rules. Please let me in. If not, if they didn't let him in, then that goes to showing that 
um, that's, in a, that's an ineffective uh, legal alternative for him. And it's the Commonwealth's position that an individual, not just in the homeless context, an individual cannot knowingly place themselves in a position of imminent danger and then expect to receive the necessity defense. And just to draw... But what do, we, uh, what do an, we do with the fact that many, maybe most homeless people have mental health issues? Are we supposed to assume rationality for them? I mean, what are they supposed to... I mean, I guess well, the, the other way is, okay, it's, it's 1 o'clock in the morning. Hmm. Do we look at what are his alternatives then, or do we look at what his alternatives were over the previous few weeks? I think we look at his, what his alternatives were over the previous couple of weeks. Um, and, and also at 1 o'clock in the morning, if there's a, there's a shelter again, I think they should seek assault, assistance from the shelter, seek assistance from police, <coughs> possibly go to a hospital. If there's several alternatives other than trespassing onto private profit, property. So did the Commonwealth uh, present any evidence that there were these alternatives that the that Mr. Magadini could have uh, chosen and he didn't do it. Well, uh, what, I, I thought his his point was that they would have been futile. You know, he couldn't go to Construct because he had been banned from there. So the the police came, but they didn't do anything. Well, he he had gone to Construct in two thousand seven, but. He never went back seven years I later. I know, but that's, you know, he's not going to go knock on the door at one o'clock in the morning and say, I want to reapply uh, for permission to stay here. W was that a viable alternative at one o'clock in the morning? Well, I, 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 think, I think it's reasonable to assume that if he was willing to comply with the rules at one o'clock in the morning, they wouldn't have turned him away. Oh, come on. He, no, they're going to do an intake interview at one o'clock in the morning. But they're probably the most caring people on the earth. People who work at shelters, directive shelters. I don't think they're going to turn him away if he if he's willing to work with them. Well, that's you talking. What what does the record say? I mean, well, we we don't have anything. But but again, in order to lay the foundation, he would have had to show shown that he did show up to construct at one in the morning, and they denied him access. That's where it goes to back to the Kendall case, where you have to show that there was no legal alternatives or those le legal alternatives would have been futile. But what, why does, is, is oh, the burden on him for that? Is, uh, yeah, is it, It's it, not enough for him to say, I have no other place to go, uh, and, I, and then the burden shifts to you to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the necessity doesn't exist. Well, I, I would suggest that he has to show a little more than I have nowhere else to go. He, how, how much more? Um, Saying, well, for example, in this case, um, I have sufficient money to rent an apartment. I went to uh, West Sockbridge, Pittsfield. No landlords will rent to me. <clears throat> I went to construct. They won't let me in the shelter. I went but to the police. Night. They won't. That, I don't think that's bur burdensome to the defendant. But doesn't he have to show what happened, what was available to him that night? Not last week, not last month. What was available to him that night? What could he do that night? Well, that night he could have sought assistance from the police, he could have went to the shelter. Well, okay, he could have sought assistance from the police. Do, do they have to wait for him to ask, can you put me up for the night in the police station instead of arresting him on the spot? I mean, it, was it just a question of not asking the right question? And the police would have put him up? It, w it would have been... Well, I actually, agree. they didn't arrest, they just said, you gotta leave here. So off he went into the cold and the snow, right? Well. Some but I, I don't know if I don't know if yes, it would have been nice if, if the police uh, asked him for assistance. But I think it's uh, where they where they know him so well. Again, he's got to be willing to help himself, and just you know, and also I, I think with Mr. Magadini, it got to a situation where the Commonwealth over the years had either dismissed trespassing cases converted them to civil and just got to the point where the police and the landlords came to us and said, well, we can't these trespassers. We can't, okay. we, can't but, like, we can't talk about the, that. But there's two, there's two things going on here, which is, is apparent. One is when does he, when has the defendant produced 
enough information to get the jury instruction with respect, with respect to necessity, right? Mm -hmm. And so one of the things, the third element, is uh, showing that there were no legal alternatives that would have effectively abated the danger. That's his showing in order to get the jury instruction. All right. So the judge concluded he hadn't made that here, hadn't made that showing. But he still allowed the defense counsel to argue necessity. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Correct. And did he allow the defense counsel to develop the evidence that would um, support that argument during the trial? I, I would su suggest so because defense counsel argued that, um, in, in summary, the defense counsel argued that Mr. Maganini had nowhere else to go and it turned into a storm, so he decided to s seek shelter for a short period to keep warm. But without an instruction, how is the jury supposed to deal with that? Judge says, here's, here's the crime of trespass, da 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 da. There's nothing about you get to do this, uh, competing harms or anything. I mean, how's a jury supposed to figure out unless, it, unless it's you know, using its option to disregard the law. I, I agree it's more difficult without a jury instruction. However, you know, turn into the case law that we presume that jurors are sophisticated and I think they could understand a, a common sense argument from the defense that he uh, sought shelter uh, in order to keep warm. Um, but the, yeah. the, 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 the judge, I assume, said here are the elements of the crime, and if you find the Commonwealth has proven those beyond a reasonable doubt, he's guilty. And I assume by that standard, there's no doubt he was guilty. Correct? Correct. So how is the jury supposed to take into effect this necessity defense when in fact the judge told them, here are the elements, did the Commonwealth prove them? The answer of course was yes, he was trespassing. How is the jury supposed to incorporate a necessity defense in their so-called common sense evaluation. Common sense would say that the judge told us we have to do this and we're doing this and he's guilty. It, you raise a good point, Your Honor. Um, I mean, it's different from something like a Bowdoin defense, you know, where judge often doesn't give an instruction but allows the defendant. To, but that goes to, so the defense argues there's reasonable doubt here because the police did a lousy job of investigating and reasonable doubt the Commonwealth has to prove beyond. That's different from here when you've got these elements. Yeah. Which is saying essentially, if, even if you were to find these elements, you may find him not guilty if. That's what the jury never got. Mm -hmm. uh, well, well, these, these were all tried together, a single trial? That's correct. But um, I, I just wanted to say that I, th I think this is similar to Commonwealth v. Vasquez, a case out of this court in 2012, which dealt with the uh, defense of duress. And in that case, the court, this court stated that an individual who recklessly uh, placed themselves, puts himself in a position where coercion will probably be applied cannot receive the defense. So I think this is a similar situation where an individual cannot not only place themselves in imminent you danger. Do you know of any case that applies that rule to the necessity defense? No, but, uh, but that's why I cite Vasquez because the defense of uh, duress is very similar to the defense of necessity. And I would suggest that it not only applies in the context of homeless individuals, but take it out of the context. So say, for example, a husband and wife are um, expecting a child within a week, and the wife says, leave your cell phone on. I, could need, I need a ride to the hospital at any moment. The partner goes out and drinks, and then he gets a call from the wife. And because it was foreseeable, that risk was foreseeable, I don't, He's going he's gonna to drive in Pia to get his wife to the hospital, but I don't believe he's entitled to the necessity defense. Well, but let's take that point. Okay. Let's assume the wife says, I can feel the contractions. It's quite urgent, and he speeds to get to the hospital. You would say no necessity defense because if he was smarter, he should have anticipated that and left earlier. Well, right, I would say that because she, 
because he knows that, that she could give birth at any time, he, he could foresee that you know, he, he would be dr driving impaired. So if he was lawful, so then he should have driven the speed limit, even if it may have resulted in harm to the well, mother and the child because he was too darn stupid to not have left earlier? He, he's going to drive over the speed limit, but he's just not entitled to the defense. Okay, thank you. We'll take our morning thank break. Thank you. <clears throat>